Hello. In the last video, we derived the threshold voltage equation of an NMOS transistor. In this video, we will look at this equation in some more details. NMOS and PMOS both have the same threshold voltage equation. In case of PMOS, either a few terms are negative or they have different values. So let's first recall what each individual term mean in this equation. The first term is the surface potential of silicon, that is, it represents the voltage across silicon. Second term represents voltage across oxide. Third term is gauge substrate contact potential difference. We stick to calling it metal silicon contact potential difference, although in most cases, gate is not made of metal. The last term represents oxide trap charges, any surface defect present on oxide silicon boundary or for any unaccounted charges for that matter. So now let's look at phi f because it not only appears in the first two terms but also affects the third term. Recall the band diagram of a p-type silicon. EC is the bottom of conduction band, EV is the top of valence band and EFI is the Fermi level of the pure or intrinsic silicon. As we increase the doping concentration of acceptor dopants, the Fermi level moves down towards the valence band. Now let's try to recall why we have 2 phi f in this equation. Let's assume that oxide silicon interface is on the left side along this line. Now when we apply a positive gate voltage, it causes some voltage at the silicon surface and that voltage causes band bending. Now since there is no current flow through this device, the Fermi level remains flat horizontal line. As a result, any positive voltage at silicon surface reduces the difference between intrinsic Fermi level which is bending with the bands and the extrinsic Fermi level which is not bending because there is no current. For smaller gate voltage this difference is still positive but for the large enough values this difference starts to become negative. In fact this difference is an important criteria to define region of operation of MOS transistor. So here we have marked this difference in two different ways. In the red, we have the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic Fermi level difference. And in the blue, we have absolute movement of Fermi level. So let's for the moment assume that these last two terms of threshold voltage equations are zero. In these conditions, for the zero gate voltage, we are on the left side of this line. For any positive gate voltage, we start to move right along this line. We can divide this line into two different reasons. To the left of this line, the extrinsic Fermi level is still below the intrinsic Fermi level and at the surface silicon still looks like a p-type silicon. This region of operation is known as depletion region of operation. On the right of this line, the Fermi level of silicon goes above the intrinsic Fermi level and it looks more like an n-type silicon. This event is known as inversion of the surface and this region is known as inversion region. Now threshold voltage is defined as the gate voltage which causes surface to be as much n type as it was p type to begin with. And that is why we have 2 phi f in the threshold voltage equation. Now inversion reason is again divided into two reasons of operations. So below threshold voltage which is this region is known as weak inversion or sub threshold and above this line is known as strong inversion. Now weak and strong inversions are very different in their transport mechanism. So it's only fair to expect that this transition doesn't happen suddenly. This transition region is defined by its own name which is moderate inversion. You have probably heard these terms before but now you understand the physical origin of these terms. The case of PMOS is mirror image of the NMOS case. There we start with Fermi level above intrinsic level and then that level moves down. So in the case of PMOS, the first term and the second term are negative. Okay, so now let's try to estimate the value of phi f. Phi f is given by this rather simple equation. This equation contains three terms. Phi t, which is the familiar thermal voltage, which is around 26 millivolt at the room temperature. N a, which is the substrate doping concentration. And N i which is the carrier concentration in pure or intrinsic silicon. Ln or ln stands for natural logarithm or logarithm with the base E. Now pause for a moment and consider this number Ni. This number represents free electron and holes 
in a cubic centimeter volume. Now compare it against the total number of atoms present in the same volume. This number is almost 12 order of magnitude larger than an I. In simple terms, these two numbers means that there is only one free electron hole pair for over a trillion atoms in the pure silicon. Now free electron hole pairs are what carry a current in semiconductor. There is no wonder that pure silicon is almost an insulator. Now let's consider the doping concentration Na. Even in a lightly doped silicon, Na is around 10 to the power 16 per cubic centimeter. This is almost 6 order of magnitude higher than Ni. So when we take Na as the carrier concentration of a doped silicon, it's a very good approximation. Now it is important to remember that this value of Ni is at room temperature. Ni is actually a very strong function of temperature which we will consider later. So now let's calculate the value of phi f for a few values of Na. So here we are. Now substrate is rather lightly doped. So the doping concentration would be around 10 power 16 to 10 power 17 per cubic centimeter. So in following calculation, I would assume phi f to be around 0.4 volts. Okay, now let's turn our attention to the second term, in particular the factor gamma. Gamma, which is also known as body effect coefficient, is given by a slightly more complicated equation. This equation contains four terms. Q is the charge of electron. Epsilon Si is the permittivity of the silicon, which is given by this value. 11.8 is relative permittivity of the silicon, and this number is the permittivity of the vacuum. Na is now familiar substrate doping concentration. And see this ox is the unit capacitance of gate oxide. This unit capacitance depends on the gate oxide thickness. Numerator is the relative permittivity of oxide and T ox is the oxide thickness. Oxide thickness is usually a few tens to few hundreds of angstrom or few nanometer. So let's calculate this oxide capacitance for a few values of gate thickness. So here we have calculated the unit gate oxide capacitance into different units. First column is femtofarad per micrometer square, which is very useful during the designs because we size the devices in micrometers. And second column is microfarad per centimeter square, which we can use to calculate the gamma. Okay, now let's calculate the gamma for doping concentration of 10 to the power 17. So here we have value of gamma for different oxide thickness. So we see that gamma increases proportionally to the oxide thickness. And that means as we increase the oxide thickness, this second term also increases proportionately. So let's choose the gamma in the second row for our future calculations. Now let's consider our third term contact potential. Contact potential is closely related to the concept of work function. Work function is a minimum energy required to extract an electron from a solid surface. So if extracting electron is easy, work function is low. And if it is difficult, work function is high. For example, consider n-type and p-type silicon. Electrons are majority carrier in n-type while minority carrier in the p-type silicon. So it will be relatively easier to take out an electron from n-type silicon as compared to p-type silicon. That means work function of p-type silicon will be higher than n-type silicon. When we join n and p-type silicon to make a diode, the contact potential reduces as we go from n-type to p-type. So defined in this order, the contact potential will be negative. This is because here we have followed the usual voltage notation where V12 is V2 minus V1. Now if we define the work function difference in the similar way, it will come out to be positive. And since some treatment use contact potential and other treatment use the work function difference, it may cause a lot of confusion. So we define the work function difference in such a way that its polarity comes out to be same as the contact potential. Now let's assume that N and P are not in the direct contact with each other, but there is another material, let's say intrinsic semiconductor in between. So what will be the total work function difference of this combination? As it turns out, the total work function difference would be simply the work function difference of the first material and the last material. Any material in between will cancel out because it will come with the negative polarity in one expression and positive polarity in the other expression. Now coming back to work function, we see that work function of a semiconductor depends on its doping concentration. 
This is because work function when defined in the band diagram depends on the Fermi level of the semiconductor. So we define another quantity for the semiconductor which does not change with the doping concentration and it is called electron affinity. Electron affinity is the difference of energy of free space or vacuum and the bottom of conduction band. So in this diagram we have energy of free space over here and this is the conduction band of the silicon. And difference between the two is electron affinity. Work function is the difference between energy of vacuum and the Fermi level. Now since in a pure silicon Fermi level sits in the middle of the energy band gap, we can derive a relation between these quantities. So work function of pure or intrinsic silicon is around 4.6 electron volt. Now since Fermi level of doped silicon either moves up or down depending on the type of doping, the work function also moves. So for our chosen value of 5F, for p-type silicon it would be around 5 electron volt and for n-type silicon it would be around 4.2 electron volt. Now in order to calculate 5ms, let's assume same gate material for both PMOS and NMOS, let's say aluminium. Although remember that gate material is highly doped polysilicon in almost all modern technologies. But we will come to this point later. So for our example, which is a typical textbook example, the work function of metal is 4.1 electron volt. So now we can calculate the work function difference of metal and semiconductor. So we see that for the same gate material, work function difference of the p-type silicon is significantly more negative than n-type silicon. And this fact would introduce an asymmetry between n-type and p-type silicon threshold voltage. A small note about the unit of the voltages. So we are being inconsistent in our notation because we are using volts for some quantities and electron volt for some other quantities. Electron volt is simply volts multiplied by the charge of electron. We can often use these quantities interchangeably if we are consistent with our definitions. So if we want to be consistent here and let's say we want to use volts as unit then we should divide the first three term by Q. Some textbooks use a different symbol for the quantity phi by Q. In this video, let's assume we are using volts for the units. So let's now collect our third term in the list and move forward to the fourth term. This last term is in fact a collection of many different small effects. CMOS fabrication process uses many different chemicals at different stages which tends to contaminate the gate oxide. In fact, this contamination was the reason that MOS was so difficult to fabricate in the early days. This contamination mostly contains the positively charged metal ions. These metal ions are also mobile, that means they move within the oxide depending on the applied potential. And this can introduce drift in threshold voltage with time. Second source of these charges is fixed surface states or interface charges. Then there can be oxide trap charges, for example electrons or holes trapped inside the oxide. One way these trap charges can be created is by hot carrier injection. So let's stop our list here by just saying that there are multiple origins of these charges. The important parameter for us to know is what is the density and polarity of these charges. The net charge tends to be positive both for n-type and p-type silicon. And total surface density of charge tends to be of the order of 10 to power 10 per centimeter square. So let's calculate the last term by using 20 angstrom gate oxide thickness. So in this calculation Q is the charge of electron. So this value comes out to be really small as compared to the other values that we have calculated so far. Okay so let's collect all the terms and see what the threshold voltage comes out to be. Okay so here we have the table with one row each for NMOS and PMOS. First column is 25F. Now we know that 5F is 0.4 volts. This term will be positive for NMOS and negative for PMOS. Just to recall again, when we say NMOS, we are talking about P-type substrate and PMOS would have N-type substrate. Second term will also be positive for NMOS and negative for PMOS. This second term is small here because we have used very thin oxide thickness. Now let's complete our table by filling the third and fourth column as well. And finally we add all these terms. And we arrive at rather surprising results. And most threshold voltage is practically zero 
while PMOS has rather high threshold voltage. We have done nothing wrong in our calculations. In fact, this is what we get after first round of manufacturing. These devices are called native devices. If you see your technology device list, you may find NVT or 0VT and MOS transistors. So this is what that is. High threshold voltage PMOS is practically useless. So it is not included in standard device offering. So how do we arrive at the threshold voltages that we are accustomed to see? Now there are many knobs involved and threshold engineering is a complex field, but we can understand the idea behind it. Look at this fourth column. For a given charge density, both are negative and both are of same value. If we could introduce a fifth term in this equation similar to the fourth term but opposite in polarity, we could shift both the threshold voltage in the positive direction. Now this new term is called threshold adjust implant. And if we set this value appropriately, we can get the symmetrical and rather familiar values of threshold voltages. Now if you see your technology device list again, you can find many flavors of devices. So there are core devices which are low voltage devices, there are IO devices which are high voltage devices and then there are many flavors of core devices. Core and IO devices differ in their gate oxide thickness. For example, in modern technologies, core device gate thickness can be 10 to 20 angstrom or 1 to 2 nanometer, while gate thickness in IO devices can be 50 to 100 angstrom or 5 to 10 nanometers. Core devices differ in their threshold implants. So in this video, we have looked at the numbers involved in the threshold voltage equation. We still need to discuss the temperature and process variations, which will be the subject of next video. So for now, post your comments below and thanks for watching.